nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, and we're honored to have as our guest today uh, the distinguished United States Senator from New Hampshire, Bob Smith. Co uh, Senator Smith began his career in Washington as a member of Congress uh, in the mid-80s. In 1990, he was elected to the United States Senate, and he has since been re-elected. In addition to having personally served in the armed forces of the United States, uh, he has become an expert on national security affairs as a member of the Senate Committee on Armed Services. Uh, Bob is a devoted husband and father, and he was a successful businessman uh, before becoming active in politics in the Granite State of New Hampshire. Currently, Senator Smith uh, is in the midst of a campaign for the presidency of the United States. Senator, what uh, impelled you to seek the presidency? That's the old Ted Kennedy question, isn't it? Well, I'm Why sure do you you'll, you'll handle it better. <laughs> Why do you want to be president? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, well, I, I think, first of all, we need a change, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, I can give you two or three reasons. I want, to, I want to get back to the United States Constitution. I want to restore the right to life in America. I want to restore the Second Amendment in America. Uh, I, want to, uh, I want to restore the national defense of this country that's been run down into the ground by uh, President Clinton. I'd like to get us out of Kosovo, hopefully... That won't be an issue, and we will be out by the time the campaign rolls around. But with Bill Clinton, you never know. We may be in a ground war there, the way we're going. Uh, I also would like to uh, focus on the sovereignty of the United States of America, which we're giving away. It's time to get out of the United Nations and, and stop signing these international trade agreements. I, we'll probably get into it a little later, but as you know, the Chinese are now have got their hands on both ends of the Panama Canal. They try to get the Long Beach Naval Shipyard. So, and, and finally, I think just the issue of character. If uh, Bob and Mary Jo Smith are in the White House, you'll never have to be ashamed of it while we're there. I promise. Make I'm that sure promise. that's true, Bob. You've certainly uh, demonstrated that in your entire public career. Uh, one of the challenges which you and others face <coughs> is that there are several people seeking the Republican nomination who more or less appeal to the same constituency. People like Pat Buchanan, Alan Keyes, Gary Bowers, some would include uh, some of the other candidates in that category. Clearly, you do have uh, uh, a better credentialed background to offer, having been elected twice to the U.S. Senate and on more than one occasion to the House of Representatives. But uh, isn't it a very difficult thing uh, for someone in your position to, first of all, win the conservative primary within the GOP, and then to have establishment Republicans who disagree with you on all of those very important issues to which you referred accept your nomination if you were to win it? Well, clearly, um, I think that's, that's a fair assessment. I, 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 I believe, though, that uh, your, the, the credentials that I bring, and I don't want to say anything bad about the other guys, especially uh, Pat Buchanan, who's a personal friend of mine, Gary Bauer, Alan Keyes, uh, good guys and, and, and strong conservatives. The only thing I, I would, you know, every, what do I bring to the table that they don't? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a new face to the presidential scene, but I'm an old warrior, I mean, in, on the conservative causes. And for 15 years, I mean, I've had every, I think, the conservative union and the caucuses and all the conservative ratings, for the most part, I'm 100%. Well, I the, might, there's no question. Your and, record in the U.S. Senate is better from a constitutional conservative perspective than that of any of the other uh, 99 members of that body. And you proved that again just the other day when you were one of two United States Senators who took a stand against the Ashbrook Amendment, which would have placed unconstitutional uh, restrictions on the availability of guns and ammunition. Right, and we can talk about that in a second uh, uh, on the guns. But, you know, again, I, I, I think the key here, and I, one of the things I've been trying to convince con conservative of, conservatives of for years is we need to win. You know, the only thing Hillary Clinton ever said that I agree with is, first you win. She did say that, and she's right. And, and so, you know, I, I've been there. I've been in the trenches. I've, I've taken my hits. I run in a state that's fairly conservative, but not as conservative as, say, Louisiana or some other. The it's southern not state, a sure thing. You've got a liberal Democratic a, governor. That's right. It's not a sure thing. We had a liberal Democratic governor, uh, and I took the seat from a, a, a moderate Democrat, Norm Damore, in 1984. I didn't defeat him, but he gave it up and ran against Gordon Humphrey and lost. 
And, and so we've had a history there of Democrats, and as you say, a liberal Democrat governor. But I, I have stood up on the, on the right to life, on guns, and all these issues, and won. You were one of only three who voted against the confirmation of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right. So I've, I've tried to be pure. I've tried to do stand on principle. I can put my head down at night and I can say, you know, maybe I was one of two or three, but I, but I, I stood my ground. I, I voted on principle. That, that's how and Barry so, Goldwater got his start. There well, were innumerable votes in the 1950s right. when he was in the Senate where it was 96 to 1 or uh, 95 to 2, whatever it might have I don't, been. I don't look up there to see how they voted. I just vote. And mm -hmm. Mel Thompson, the former, I'm sure you know, the former governor of New Hampshire, who, by the way, is very ill right now, but, a, but a, a wonderful man. He's been like a father to me as well as a political mentor. Well, he was the first national chairman of the conservative party. That's right, and uh, he was, and he ran for president, too, as you know. And I, and I, but he said, stand for something or stand for nothing. That was his advice to me, and he's right. I mean, if you can't stand up for what you believe in, you know, you think you ever see those hamsters that they, they, they get in these wheels and these cages and they go round and around and around? I have a couple of them at home. <laughs> well, they never get anywhere, you know <laughs> what I mean? It's like the exercise bike. He rides it, but you don't get anywhere. So. So the thing is, uh, you know, why do that? Why put yourself through that? Why get elected, compromise your views to get elected again? It's just not worth it. So what I bring to the table that I think the other guys don't is they've been there. They've some of Pat and, and Alan have run before twice and they've lost. And they really haven't gotten that, you know, that far up into the votes. Gary Bowers never run for president before. I've run and I've won in New Hampshire, granted. But if I can win in New Hampshire, I can win in Louisiana and Alabama and, and some of these other uh, states that are very much more conservative than, uh, than, than New Hampshire. So I can make this a race, Howie, and, that, and that's why I'm running. And I, as I say, I'm taking nothing away from those guys. They're wonderful people and good friends of mine, great conservatives. But I want to win, Senator, and I want to unite the conservatives to do that. Senator, this broadcast is being taped. Uh, today's date is May 18, 1999. Many people will see this broadcast for the first time months from now, but mindful of that, uh, I was frankly very encouraged to read in this morning's Washington Times an article by Ralph Hallow, which indicated that you were giving some thought to the possibility of being not only a February candidate, but a November candidate by uh, permitting your name uh, to uh, be on the ballot in November outside the major parties. Well. What, what, what I talked about in the Washington Times with Ralph Hallow, I, I, was, I was trying to issue a wake-up call to the Republican Party, uh, not, not to necessarily all the people in it, but to the party organization, which is, look, those of us that are pro-life and pro-gun, uh, pro-sovereignty, who stand up for what we believe in, they're, they're trying to marginalize, it, marginalize us. You know, I don't want to be somewhere where I'm not wanted, and I don't want to destroy the Republican Party. That's never been my object objective. I've always been a Republican all my life. But if the party's going to walk away from me, there's a lot of precedent. There was a fellow named Lincoln in 1854 who was a Whig. And what happened? The Whig party said, let's elect more Whigs and let's not be so strong against slavery. And Mr. Lincoln, who is our party standard bearer, uh, took a walk and he said, my party's left me. I am against slavery and I am going to stand up for being against slavery and the Republican Party was born as a result of, of a Whig party that refused to stand up on principle. Wouldn't it be ironic if the very party that Lincoln founded refused to stand up on principle against abortion, which is the moral outrage of the 20th century? Well, in 1860, Lincoln was elected president <coughs> even though there were 11 states <coughs> where he received not a single vote and even though uh, in the popular vote he only had about 39 percent. Correct. How do you think you would do in a three-way race? Well, Howie, I think that I think a three-way race uh, for president with a strong conservative, whether it was me or someone else, uh, I, I believe uh, could, uh, I think you would see that race split pretty well uh, between three candidates. And I think that any one of the three could win it. I don't think you can assume at all that it's going to favor uh, the Democrat, let's just say it's Gore, Bush, and Smith. Uh, if it is, uh, first of all, I think that uh, a lot of uh, conservative Catholics uh, who are Democrats, who really don't know what else to do, they don't want to become Republicans, so, and, and so they, they kind of stick with the ticket, even though they'd prefer to so go... So your stand on trade, trade <clears throat> on guns, guns, on jobs, on abortion, uh, I think would be very attractive. I think it would be a coalition... Democratic voters. Would be a coalition, I think would be a, a strong coalition. 
and I think that we could win in the South. Uh, I think we could win in, you know, uh, I think we could win in the West, and you'd be a few battleground states like perhaps Illinois, Ohio, maybe Pennsylvania, uh, maybe Michigan. I think it's, uh, you know, you've got to look at, you know, everybody talks about, oh, well, you know, third party. Jesse Ventura, I might say, Governor Ventura, 37% of the vote. What was that all about? Well, what it was about, it was somebody who was, I don't agree with Jesse Ventura on the issues uh, most for the most part, but Jesse Ventura came out of nowhere. Uh, everybody rate, wrote him off, and, he, and, and he, 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 he said, look, it's not working here with these two parties. They don't stand for anything. I believe that, we could, that, uh, that, could, that could be done. I, as I say, at this point today, I'm, on May 18th, I'm not advocating it, frankly. I'm trying to give a wake-up call to my party, but if it doesn't wake up, what then factors we have to do something else. will you bear in mind uh, in making a decision as to whether or not it would be appropriate for you to seek the presidency as an independent or third-party candidate? Well, you know, Howie, I, I, we discussed this a little bit off the air, I, and I, and I want to say this, and maybe it'll offend some people. But I've been in the conservative movement now for, well, I've been elected for 15 years, and I've been in the conservative movement for 20 years. I was working for Gordon Humphrey and helping him get elected in 1978, <coughs> long before I got elected a, in New Hampshire. And I think that if people, if the conservatives in this country want to change things, then they've got to unite together, stop the ego trips, stop all the, uh, the, the putting fundraising for every uh, uh, or conservative organization in America ahead of America, which is what a lot of them do. And I'm going to be, I know I'll make some people mad here, so be it. We need to unite. We need to say a talk show, uh, how much money I raise for my organization or what I do as a 501c, none of those things are as important as changing America. Let's do what they've been talking about for the last 25 years. And in order to do it, we've got to unite, we've got to go after it, because let me tell you, the liberals <laughs> and the two parties are going to go after whoever does that big time, and you can't do it alone. You've well, got to have troops. One of your greatest strengths, Senator, is that if they go after you, they're going to have to make something up, because I know you're as clean as a whistle. Stay with us. I'll be right back with Senator Bob Smith right after these messages. Hi, I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus. I'm inviting you to learn more about the Conservative Caucus, a grassroots public policy action organization that was founded in 1974. Whether you're opposed to socialized medicine, interested in making Congress more accountable, stopping the New World Order, fighting gun control, reducing taxes, or restoring America to its biblical premises and constitutional boundaries, we're the organization you're looking for. Please call the number on your screen to get more information about our work. For more information, write the Conservative Caucus, 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180, or call 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips with the United States Senator Robert Smith of the Granite State of New Hampshire. Senator Smith, uh, the Republican Party has collected many dollars and many votes by presenting itself as the pro-life party, the party that would defend the Second Amendment. But uh, we've seen that when push comes to shove, the Republican leadership is, to put it mildly, divided on these issues. Why are there so many divisions within the GOP? Can those breaches ever be healed uh, in favor of constitutional principles to defend uh, the lives of the American people and to uh, protect their right to keep and bear arms. You know, taking the first issue of life, how it's amazing to me that we're all, those of us who stand up for that, the right to life, which is, as you know, a flank in the Republican Party, we're accused of being divisive. Uh, and uh, we, we are attacked uh, uh, because we support and, and, and talk about that right. And what you're seeing and hearing now from candidates prospective presidential candidates as well as others in the leadership of the party is like Pataki and others is 
it's too divisive. Let's not let's not deal with it. See, that's uh, that that doesn't make any sense to me because without life, you can't be free. You can't pursue your dreams or your happiness or your prosperity. So, life is basic, and I I can never walk away from it. I think it's it's one of the most important, if not the most important, issues, moral issues certainly of our time. So, you know, I I'm pro-life. If I'm president of the United States, I will appoint only pro-life judges. They'll be pro-constitution judges, which means they'll be pro-life. Constitution says no person That's may be deprived of life without the correct. process of law. Amen. And if I read my paper correctly, you have introduced legislation to defend the personhood of the unborn. Life, life. begins at fertilization or conception, whatever yeah. term you choose. That's a, uh, that's a very important thing to do. A lot, uh, I favor a constitutional amendment if one is needed. I favor doing whatever you need to do. But I believe firmly Get rid that, of Roe v. That, Wade is what you're going to do. That if you establish the personhood of the unborn child, under the Constitution, abortion is unconstitutional. Absolutely. That's what Blackman said. That's what Stevens said. Right. They said if a child is a legal person, abortion is unconstitutional. Amen. That's, that's it. And, and I think of when, I, when you go back and look at the numbers and the horrors of this last 25 or 30 years under Roe v. Wade, 35 million children that we know of have been aborted. That's one-ninth of the entire the United States population. And you start to think about that and you say, how many of those kids, the oldest one would probably be about 30 now, how many of those kids might have been doctors, just good husbands, good wives, you know, moms, dads, maybe a cure for cancer? Who knows? Not one of them should have been killed. Not one of them should have been killed and every one, live, every one of those lives lost and America did it. And yet, you know, we, we, uh, we get all worked up over you know, over, over things that I don't think are as important as that. And for the sake of party unity, uh, the Republican leadership, including Henry Hyde, have said, yeah, we've got to give money to people like Christy Todd Whitman who support uh, partial birth abortion, better known as infanticide. See, I, I, I don't agree with that, and I couldn't do it. I, I, you know, people say, well, what about Whitman? Do you want her in the party? Christy Todd Whitman can be in my party if she wants to. I just don't want her to change my party. She can choose that if she wishes. And I know she agrees with us on some things, uh, taxes maybe, and, and, and that sort of thing. However, the point is don't change the party. Don't take the planks out of the party that are basic. You know, Ronald Reagan faced this issue. He dealt with the issue up front, and he got an overwhelming uh, vote twice to be president. You just people want you to be truthful. That's all. I know that's a little rusty when you're thinking about Bill Clinton not being truthful, but... It's, it's a, maybe they just need a little refresher here. On what if enough. things seem to be going the other way? What if it appears that George Bush has a lock on the nomination? He supports Bill Clinton's war in Kosovo. He's taken a wishy-washy position on abortion. On guns. Uh, on guns. Uh, he's, uh, his family is uh, very important in communist China. His, one of his relatives by the name of Prescott Bush is a leader in the U.S. Red China Business Council. Uh, how can someone with the constitutional conservative principles you have demonstrated uh, sit back and accept that when you have the option of being a candidate yourself in November? <laughs> You're asking tough questions. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm going to cross. I'm, I'm not. You know, you know me. I don't like to duck any questions. No, no, I understand. But, I, but I'm going to cross. I'm going to cross the bridge uh, as as I come to it. Uh, and mm -hmm. I don't think at this point that there's a foregone conclusion that Bush will be the nominee. He's playing this thing pretty close to the vest, you know, and sitting back there in Austin and people are coming in with the money and the, and the endorsements. But he hasn't said a word, really, uh, out on the stump yet. And when he does, he's going to be scrutinized. But, you know, I'm going to go, go slowly. As I said before, uh, I'm going I'm to look very carefully. I'm interested in hearing what all the conservatives out here listening to our show, uh, your show, not mine. Well, it's uh, yours tonight. Well, uh, it's <laughs> yours. And I, and, you know, what do they think about it? What do they think about a third party? What do they think about somebody uh, leading a third party? I mean, I, I think it, it can't be done alone. That's right. It's got to be a conservative unity thing. And if there's an interest in it, then we can take a look at it. But if, it, it, as I say, it's not going to be one person saying, I'm going to be the nominee uh, for president, and then nobody's going to follow. I mean, we need to hear from people. I think, in fairness, you've been through it. You know what it's like. And people that you thought were your friends weren't your friends. And they should have been your friends. They weren't. Yeah. Uh, I have no regrets. But uh, in the United States Senate, those of us who believe that our God-given right to self-defense <coughs> existed even before the Second Amendment to the Constitution, 
have been shocked and amazed at the Republican uh, retreat. It's been. I mean, when you have someone who was almost a conservative presidential candidate like John Ashcroft leading a charge for one gun control measure, when you see Larry Craig, a man I uh, appreciate and like and who's been a good senator, switch uh, from one day to the next and in effect uh, embrace the position which the previous day he had rejected, uh, it's very troubling. Why does this happen? And why is there not more confidence on the part of leadership to do what they promised the people they would do? On that vote that you're referring to, we snatched defeat from the jaws of victory again. Uh, I don't understand it, How I can't defend it. I don't know why we do these things. We won the vote uh, on one day. Uh, Bill Clinton started screaming about it, uh, attacking I mean, us. Janet, and Janet Ray, Reno I mean, started the woman who, who led the massacre in Waco, right. how can she be a, a moral uh, tutor to the Republican They started Party? hammering us, and then, and then to, you got to, don't mm. blame it on Clinton and Reno entirely, because two or three Republican senators went to the leader and said, if you don't, if you don't reverse this, we're going to call for another vert, vote, and we're going to reverse it. I would have said, go ahead, Re reverse it if you think you can. But instead, we turned it around and we, and we gave them uh, uh, another gun control measure. And, you know, look, I, I, I had a debate tonight on Crossfire, and I know this is being taped, but with Dick uh, Durbin, this, uh, the senator from Illinois. The goal here of these people is to take away the rights of gun owners, uh, to have a gun show, to take guns, take handguns away from the American people. And as I've said, as I said in that, in that debate with the, Mr. Dur Senator Durbin, Look, 99% of the American people who own guns are honest, law-abiding, good citizens. Why are we harassing them for the sake of a few killers? And, and the key point is that the killers will get the guns anyway. They'll get them on the black the market law, and everybody else gets and harassed. And the law-abiding will be denied the opportunity for self-defense. And let me give you an example of that, Howie, firsthand. Uh, in uh, a few, four or five years ago, I witnessed the shooting. At, uh, at in front of the CIA. I was driving along in my car. I stopped at the red light. And as, as most of you know who are in, live in the area, there are two lanes that turn into the CIA, and I happened to be in the lane that was going by, but we were all stopped. I'm looking at this guy face to face with an AK-47. I'm in my car. Um, I'm 15, 10, 15 feet. The guy's aimed it right, it's right at me. But he, he decided, for whatever reason, in that instant where you, you're just frozen, you just don't... He decides to turn and walk to these other two cars and literally executes two people right in front of me. Um, I'm on my way to Washington, D.C., where there is gun control. Therefore, I can't have a gun, so I don't have one in my car. If I'd have had a gun in, that, in my car, I might have been able to do something about that guy before he did that killing. I'm not saying I would or could have gotten it out, but at least I didn't have a chance because I didn't have one because I was going to Washington where it was against the law. And, of course, as we all know, Washington has such a low crime rate, you know, as a result of all well, these. I mean, maybe, the criminals have guns. They kill, yeah, maybe, they kill the rest of us, and so it's the highest crime rate in, rate in well, America. Mary, Mayor Barry, when he was the mayor of Washington, said that, in fact, D.C. had one of the lowest crime rates in the country if you didn't count the killings. Oh, you know? my goodness gracious. <laughs> But, you know, but it, it, we have unilateral disarmament of the law by it, it is so outrageous. I mean, they don't. Under, the, the Second Amendment is under siege, and the Republicans put a crack in it. And they, with, uh, they joined the Democrats, put a crack in it. By the time your viewers see this tape, I believe they're going to pass this 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 uh, uh, juvenile crime bill, and which is are, itself unconstitutional because it uh, puts the federal government in matters it, of local law enforcement. There are a lot of good things we, in there, but you know, one, one last just, thing before uh, the break: isn't it ironic uh, that they rejected? Uh, a motion to chastise Hollywood, even yeah. as they were passing gun control. In other words, they're saying the First Amendment, as they interpret it, is sacrosanct, but the Second Amendment can be scrubbed. We have to take a break right now. Please stay with me. We'll be back right after these messages with Senator Bob Smith. In every major war of the 20th century, control of the Panama Canal has been strategically crucial to America's military. Now the great U.S. Navy is no longer a two-ocean navy, and the Red Chinese military knows very well that control of the Isthmus is more important than ever. That's why Red China now seeks control of the two crucial ports on each side of the Panama Canal. If Congress fails to give our military the funds to maintain U.S. bases in Panama, Red China will fill the vacuum giving a communist superpower a hammerlock grip on the path between the seas. Right now, there's no money in the defense budget to keep our U.S. bases in Panama, 
And even as we reduce our defense spending, Red China boosts theirs with 40 billions of dollars each year coming from us as the result of MFN, most favored nation status. We the people, along with our leaders in Congress and at the White House, have a duty to preserve, protect, and defend America's vital interest. Welcome back. We've been honored to have as our guest for this broadcast, Senator Bob Smith of New Hampshire. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please check out the website of the Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org. And if you would like to learn more about Senator Smith, his stands on the issues and ways in which you can become involved, please contact uh, Senator Smith's uh, office at the address and phone number shown on your screen. Senator, we have just about a minute. Uh, one of the areas of expertise that you've developed during your years in Congress uh, is national defense. Our defense has declined extraordinarily, really since the late 1980s. Uh, what needs to be done? Well, you're right. I've had 15 years of working on it uh, in the Congress, Howie, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, coming from a military family. I lost my dad at the end of the Second World War, served in the Navy in Vietnam. Clearly, somebody needs to have a hands-on policy. Our, our, our readiness is just a total mess. Our recruitments are down. We're losing pilots. Our op tempo is a mess. Uh, the military needs help. We need probably to infuse 25 to $30 billion a year for the next 8 to 10 years just to get back even. We've got a lot of work to do. And on top of that, this president has sent these folks all over the world asking them to do more with less Kosovo, Bosnia, Persian Gulf, you know, you name it. We've Somalia. unilaterally disarmed ourselves. Unilaterally Kosovo. disarmed ourselves. We're it's, using it's, up all those cruise missiles, haven't we? We're almost, it, we're it, almost out of, out of, the, uh, out of the, the, the uh, uh, smart weapons. It's down incredible. Down to about 70 cruises, and there's no production line open. And this guy's going to get it. I'm telling you, if it keeps going, he's going to wind up that we're going to be in a ground war. Uh, I've been told by some of the military people. Isn't it interesting that, that, that they'll they they never troops. take a stand for defending their own country, but they will take a stand to advance the objectives of uh, international socialism? Senator, we're out of time. Pleasure, Thanks for Howie. being with us. My pleasure. We appreciate it. Thank you for joining Conservative Night.